John Peter Witkin has never had the media notoriety of Andre Serrano, but his reputation in the world of art photography is even more strongly established. His highly crafted images, looking like Victorian tableau or old master paintings, have made him, it is said, the third most collected living photographer after Irving Penn and Richard Avedon. What disturbs Witkin's critics is his choice of subject matter. He makes photographs of the disabled, the deformed, and most controversially, of the dead. Only last weekend, The Independent on Sunday apologized to its readers for printing a Witkin composition that included a dead baby. Witkin's admirers, on the other hand, praise him for finding a terrible beauty in material which, as a society, we prefer to ignore or repress. Witkin's first British exhibition is currently running at Hamilton's Gallery in London. Once again, viewers may find some of the images which follow disturbing. Joel Peter Witkin was born 51 years ago in Brooklyn, the child of a Jewish father and a Catholic mother. His career began during his national service, where he worked as a military photographer, a job which involved the documentation of army suicides and training accident deaths. He developed his distinctive style of constructed photography after stints in art school in New York and in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Witkin now lives and works, and where he finds many of the subjects for his photographs. doing a painting for Mary Quiet. His documentation by way of photographs of the different sideshow and what's called freak performers in Coney Island. I went there and the, basically that was the beginning of uh, being engaged in a different world. And then when the freak show uh, had to leave Coney Island because they weren't making a business, um, I wanted to leave with them. But in a sense I left not with them physically, but I left inwardly with them in the sense that I wanted to make tableaus or theater pieces that I would direct and as still photographs. And instead of working outside as a street photographer, it was much too difficult because I hated what the aesthetic of the world is. I wanted basically then to make an enclosure. I would put people in that enclosure. I would create my own world and then fit that world in with the people I wanted to photograph and change them. The tradition of the grotesque in photography, which really goes back to the uh, medium's very early days, uh, and, and goes back before that into literature and visual arts uh, and, and all forms of creative expression, uh, concerns itself very, very specifically and at great length with the, with the possibility that there is a, a world, or let's say a level of knowledge of the world, above and beyond the level of knowledge at which we normally operate. And that, that when one enters that level of knowledge, uh, one is addressing uh, issues that are profoundly disturbing and frightening. Uh, in the grotesque vision, the world of dreams is the world of nightmare, almost uniformly. And uh, part of what makes that world nightmarish is the fear that, that if we strip off the veneer of normalcy with which we are comfortable, we will find a terrifying and chaotic universe. It's the photography of an, of an art lover. It's beautifully made. Its, sub, its subjects are maybe grotesque, cut bulls' heads, the rest of it, where art and reportage fuse together. But it, the topics, the, the subjects, the, the uh, incidents and uh, material, the debris, is set always within a, a beautifully modulated space. And he's discovered this knack of 
placing unacceptable, fascinating, curious objects within a caressing light. It's eclectic. It's a, it's a junk shop version of Leonardo. It's Courbet redone. Wittgen, I think, says that the two photographers who influenced him the most were Ouija and Arbus. And certainly they've had, uh, I may be wrong in the quote, but certainly they've had a great influence on him. Arbus, as Susan Sontag pointed out, really made uh, an interest in the grotesque acceptable in this culture. She really opened up something in the 1960s that has persisted ever since. Wittgen, I think, verges on the truly sensationalistic. And I think often it slips over into that. His pictures obviously mean to provoke us. They mean to pose ethical questions and to, to make us ask whether uh, what he's doing with these people is fair. But the fact is that he works with these people fairly consistently and openly. Um, the people themselves are far more willing to be shown than we are willing to look at them sometimes. I'm only allowed a few hours to photograph a person. That's all I could basically can take in time. And I make preparations that sometimes take months or years to eventually get permission to, to be there. And uh, usually the people I photograph are, have been totally and terribly exploited. And it's my job to, to say, this is what I've done in the past. And to convince them that the image I will make of them will be something unique at the same time, truthful to them, and something they've never seen before. I don't believe his reasons for, for justifying what he does. Um, I believe he does, again, like Arbus, he freaks disabled people. He deals with a human being and pushes them back into a freak position. Um, although he may claim humanitarian um, mission in his work, and his critics often claim this, actually they only can claim that because, as I said, the discourse ha doesn't have disabled people in it as a powerful group. I mean, I actually do believe in 20 to 30 years' time when disabled people are a powerful group, his work will be held up as a serious reactionary retrogressive step. of what I think is most deeply disturbing about, our, about engaging with Joel Peter Whitcomb's photographs is the fact that you can't look at those photographs carefully and attentively without realizing that this man, who in a certain sense is a surrogate for us, is spending a lot of time handling the dead. Do the dead mind? You know, the, the, there are some very profound philosophical questions raised by this. Do the dead care what happens to their bodies? Do they care, or do only we care, for example? In a sense, I think how we respond to this idea of what we can do with the dead depends a lot on what we, what we think happens to the soul, as we call it, at the point of death. And so these pictures make us ask those questions. Why, why is it terribly wrong for him to play with, this, with these bodies if we feel that it's wrong? Why does it disturb us? Would we not want someone doing that to us? If we would give our bodies to science, let's say, for someone to use our parts for, uh, you know, our, our eyes or our limbs or whatever, to, to uh, as, as uh, substitute organs for, for other living people, might not some of us donate our bodies to artists? There's nothing new in artists using human remains as the subject matter of their work. Jericho made these sketches of severed heads from the guillotine in preparation for a major painting. But when a photographer uses cadavers, the emotional impact is very different. Where the realities exist. I mean, they're, they're from uh, morgues, etc. I think the big difference, uh, too, is that um, because photography deals in the here and now, uh, Jericho would deal with making incredible allegories of Anitas, of still lives, with parts of bodies. And finally, it's still an invention, however horrible and beautiful they are. And I deal in the same thing, but I deal in the real. What makes Whit Whitkinson troublesome is that they look willful and fanciful 
Whereas the 19th century, uh, the catastrophe is justified by history. It's part of some larger movement. Whereas hospital sweepings and curios fairground curiosities and freaks of the kind used by uh, Whitkin are not justified by any larger movement in history at all. I am of the uh, rather old-fashioned school that, by and large, prefers a certain amount of suggestion. I think that the movies of the pre-Libertine era were sexier, by and large, where you didn't see everything, but had a lot of it implied and left to your imagination. And I think, for instance, in some of the recent still life, they're still very beautiful. They're beautifully composed. His prints are exquisite, but uh, they are taking off on a theme that was established, or at least came to a height, in 17th century Holland, uh, the Vanitas, in which uh, one spoke of the beauties of this world and its transitory nature. And the Dutch uh, showed you that sometimes by having a flower wilting or having a fly on the fruit to show you that uh, time took everything. Now, I think that gives the message and to add a baby that is dead and has been uh, sewn up or a severed foot perhaps overloads the message in some way. I think I can get the message without luxuriating in the uh, gory details. We basically know we're going to be born in an institution and die in one. And I think you mentioned too is that there are laws both here and in the States that the body is not yours, regardless of how a person is loved. After 24 hours, 48 hours, it's the state. A person is rubbish to the state, and yet that's a person who's loved. And in my case, if I have the opportunity to acknowledge the lifeness of that human being, I would. It reminds me in a way of the kind of the ravings of the people that we used to call holy fools, someone who had had a vision of the Godhead and went around simply revealing his vision to whoever would speak to that. And we would think such people today quite possibly mad or delusional, but we should at the very least just let them say their say. Maybe it couldn't hurt to let them say their say. Uh, I think there's something about that in, in the relationship of people to Joel Peter Whitkin's work. Even the people, that is, to the people who are disturbed by his work and upset by his work and angered by his work. That it's, it, is, it is so coherent, it is so clearly obsessive, it is so uh, obviously bent on pursuing a vision that uh, I think people... People sense this even if they hate what they're seeing.